Hey there, everybody. This is Professor Ellis. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, maybe you're able to use uh, the very short uh, spring recess to get caught up on things. I uh, hope you're all still healthy, that your families are healthy. Um, if anyone is sick, that you're able to manage it. Um, and also just to remind you, if anything comes up and what you need to let me know uh, how things outside of the class may be affecting your performance inside the class, as far as getting assignments done, working on the research essay, etc., please send me an email. Again, my email address is jellis at citytech.cuny.edu. Uh, it's on our Open Lab site on the syllabus, and I've mentioned it a few other times, so uh, make sure you do reach out to me that way. Um, also, a reminder Wednesday uh, between 5 and 6 p.m., I'll have my office hours using Google Hangouts. I'll post a link to our Open Lab site so you can just click on it and you'll be able to join the Hangout and ask me any questions there that you might have. If that time doesn't work for you, uh, obviously send me an email and we'll uh, communicate that way. And if we need to have like a conversation, we can also like try to find a time that's suitable for both of us. So during today's class, we need to talk about science fiction through the 1950s uh, and um, Forbidden Planet and also need to uh, tell you about Forbidden Planet before you take a look at it. Uh, remember, use that link that I provided on our Open Lab site on the syllabus, or if you can find a copy of Forbidden Planet to watch on your own, um, it's also totally fine. Uh, there's been on DVD and Blu-ray, uh, and obviously now it's available online in streaming formats. Uh, but before we do that, let's take a look over at our Open Lab site real quick. Uh, a couple things I wanted to point out to you. Um, some opportunities, some are fun, some are, are you know, hopefully going to be helpful. Uh, the first of these is something that the Open Lab started recently called Comforting Content for COVID-19 Coping. Uh, a bunch of C's there, some uh, alliteration. Well, you can see here we got Moe's, uh, and Moe's is one of the topics of this um, project we started on Open Lab, which is to share like pictures of our furry friends uh, and animals that um, you know give us a little bit of comfort in these challenging times. Uh, you might want to take a look at it if you're interested in uh, cute fuzzy animals or if you'd like to contribute. There's also instructions. I gave you a link to uh, instructions on how to contribute your own uh, little critters to the project following this page. If you don't want to go through like that more rigorous process. If you want me to share something of yours, you're also welcome to email me uh, pictures of your dogs, cats, hamsters, etc. Uh, and I can put it up there uh, on the Open Lab site, obviously giving you credit uh, for, your, for your critters. Make sure you let me know what their names are uh, um, and if it's okay to like say that this comes from you. Um, but I'd be happy to do that because it's kind of cool some of the stuff uh, that we've been putting up there so far. Uh, this is the site here, Comforting Content for COVID Coping. And uh, this post that I, I did uh, today is on Moe's. You can see Moe's uh, with his mom there when he was little. And then as he grew up and got bigger like he is today. But even though he's big, he still likes uh, little toys. Then uh, a couple of days ago, I posted one about Meow and how Meow has advice for coping uh, with difficult times, and interestingly enough, they all involve naps. And then finally, one that I posted uh, six days ago uh, is this little video that I made uh, using one of my old robots, uh, Roby Senior robot from Radio Shack um, from the 1980s, uh, and our uh, little cat Meow Meow. I'll just make a, a video uh, that Yufong and I shared with our friends in Taiwan who were getting married. Uh, but we were unable to join them for the wedding. And so there's also that idea of like how we use technology to maintain a connection, to reach out to people uh, when we can't, just like we're having to do today with um, distance learning uh, during COVID-19. So check that out if you like. Um, then if we go back to our Open Lab page, a more serious opportunity I wanted to make you guys aware of is different counseling opportunities. Uh, first, City Tech has its own counseling center, uh, but because of uh, distance learning, um, New York City pause, and, and COVID-19, you know, the people can't be there in person to meet with you. 
Uh, but if you follow this link that I, I gave on our Open Lab site, you can set up appointments to speak with people over the phone, text message, video conferencing. Um, so if you need to talk to someone about anything, they're, not, they're a great resource for you guys. I mean, they know about like City Tech students um, and you know, they, they are there on campus normally. So they, they, they know like how we're different than say other campuses and other students at those campuses. So take advantage of that if you need to. Then I also gave some links here to New York City Well. Um, and this is a program that's for the entire city uh, that you're also, um, you know, can take advantage of where you can text, call, chat, uh, with folks that can help you out, listen to you, uh, give you advice, etc., cetera, um, from a, a wellness and counseling standpoint. So take a look at those links. I highly, highly, highly recommend those now more than ever. All right. And then just also a quick reminder, uh, you know, I posted uh, Lecture 8 last week, and I also went ahead a little bit and also included the conducting research, which was normally scheduled for this week, but I wanted to give put it in front of you a, a week earlier so that you could begin doing your research as soon as possible. Um, for your summaries that are technically due on Wednesday, but you know I've told you guys I'm giving you a lot of latitude, a lot of elbow room, so if you need additional time, please do so and just let me know when you turn it in uh, with a quick email. Because uh, for me, it's more important, obviously, that you've done the work, not necessarily that it's always done immediately on time, considering everything else is going on right now. Um, but for your summaries, you don't need to summarize the lecture on research. That's for your benefit. That's to help you with your research on your research essay in the class. All that you need to summarize would be my lecture on the Golden Age of Science Fiction Part 2, and then, of course, uh, your readings, which would be uh, high lines all use zombies and Tom Goblin's the cold equations. Now for next week, I'll be posting a, a new post here for it'll be lecture nine on science fiction film through the 1950s and Forbidden Planet. Um, and so for next week's summary, you'll want to summarize lecture nine and then your viewing of Forbidden Planet. Right. Uh, so we always have access to the lecture and the readings before you do your summaries. Should be old hat to you guys by now, but I just want to remind everybody because I know like it's easy to get out of habit uh, with the way things are right now. All right, so um, let's go ahead and we will hop over to Forbidden Planet and start talking a little bit about science fiction film through the 1950s. So to start things off with science fiction film, uh, how does science fiction literature function differently than film? That's a question I want you guys to consider. And here are four points to think about. One, there's the media theorist Marshall McLuhan, M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L -L, McLuhan, M-C-L-U-H-A-N. Uh, and one of the things that he gave us is an aphorism or a saying the medium is the message. The medium is the message. And in this case, what we can think about is how each medium has different affordances, meaning things you can do with it, as well as constraints, which are things you can't do with it or things that hold you back. So every medium has affordances and constraints. Uh, if we think about, like, you know, listening to radio or just listening to music in general, the main affordance is that it has sound. Uh, it can produce musical sound, just speaking sound, um, anything that's on the auditory register, right? But there's no visual. You don't see anything. Um, whereas, like, if we think about television or film, we have the auditory as well as the visual. We're able to see things. We're able to hear things. Um, and then if we think, like, about our science fiction stories, their text, right? There's this bunch of writing. And we have to read the writing. It's visual in the sense that we see you know, characters on the page, but through our imagination, we turn those, those symbols, letters, and words, those words into sentences and the concepts, and we can imagine what's taking place in the story world of the narrative that we're happening to be reading. 
Uh, but there's no visuals in the sense of like, you know, being able to see the alien, to see the spaceship. Uh, we have to imagine what that is. And there's no auditory because we're not like hearing someone read the story to us, unless like say for example an audiobook. If we're strictly reading, um, then we're having to just read the words on the page and imagine from that. So if we think about science fiction as a literary genre, it all has to do with the visual aspect of, of written language, and then we turn that into what we imagine in our minds. And if we want to turn what we imagine in our minds into something that's both visual as well as auditory, uh, as involving sound, then there are transformations that have to take place. We are adapting the story from one medium, the written story, to the medium of, say, film, an example of Forbidden Planet. Um, and in that process of translation, that process of adaptation, there are some affordances that are gained, um, some that may be lost. There may be uh, different constraints that are lost, and well, others may be acquired. Um, maybe most notably, we may think about um, this next point that I want to make about ideas. Okay, so first off the medium is the message. Marshall McLuhan. Uh, and this means that the medium of a message, in this case a story, is shaped by the medium in which the story is presented. Okay. Second point related to that is that science fiction literature deals with ideas using words. It is analytical. It provides access to interiority. So whenever a story, in, in particular a written story, it's able to go into depth about you know, how something works or why something works. Uh, whenever we think about the characters in writing, we're able to see the interior of their minds. We're able to, to, to read what they're thinking. But whenever we come to film, television, these media don't allow easy access anyways to interiority. They don't always give easy access to an analysis of how things take place. They're not being that analytical in all cases. There are exceptions to this, such as the film The Martian, which is based on a very analytical work, uh, the novel by Andy Weir. Um, but in most cases, we see like these very stark differences between science fiction and literature and, and film or television. So the third point is that science fiction film deals with ideas by giving them visual shape. It is metaphorical. This makes it more difficult to pin down the meanings of the visual that can be made explicit with words. It deals in surfaces so that we do not have access to interiority unless the unfortunate voiceover is employed. And strictly in terms of like, you know, filmmaking, the voiceover where you have like the the character speaking but you know the the speaking isn't coming from the actual uh, actor slash character on the screen it's something that we hear as um, uh, as a way of imagining what this person is thinking or that this person is providing some narration for the benefit of the audience in the strictest sense, this is very poor filmmaking um, because it's not relying on just the visual aspects of what film is capable of doing. It's trying to do what we had easy access to in literary science fiction. And then the fourth point I wanted to make. Science fiction film does things that science fiction literature cannot do. Use illusion and make the imagined seemingly real. However, it also constrains our imagination in the same way that listening to a song and then watching the music video can create a jarring sensation. What I mean is if like say you read a story and you imagine what the characters like, what the setting is like, what maybe the spaceships are like, the aliens are like, etc. but then it gets turned into a movie or a television series and you see it and it doesn't quite jive with what you had in your imagination it, it can be an uncomfortable feeling, one in which maybe you're unhappy with the visual results. 
Um, because ultimately, those types of choices about what we see on the screen you know, come from uh, the, the movie making process, which involves producers, directors, screenplay writers, etc., to make what we see on the screen uh, into the, 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 the final version. Now, next, I want to talk about uh, some different important science fiction films, uh, just briefly, before we get into Forbidden Planet. Uh, these would be things you want to get into your notes. Really good for when you're on Jeopardy one day. You'll want to remember some of these. The first science fiction film uh, was by director uh, George Melies, M-E-L-I-E-S. And he was one of the earliest filmmakers, hands down. Um, but the first science fiction film was Le Voyage Dans la Lune. L-E, La Voyage, V-O-Y-A-G-E, Dans, D-A-N-S, La, L-A, Loon, L-U-N-E. And this was in 1902. And it's a voyage to the moon. And it's based loosely on Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon and H.G. Wells' The First Men in the Moon, two, two different novels about... Um, human beings traveling to the moon um, in that, that period late night year from the ninth, or, you know, 19th century before coming into the 20th century. Now the first major science fiction film was Fritz Long's L-A-N-G Fritz Long's Metropolis M-E-T-R-O P-O L I S. And this is from 1926. Coincidentally, the same year, what happened? That would be April 1926 when Amazing Stories was launched by Hugo Gernsback. Now, Fritz Long's Metropolis, it, it was a German film. It was a silent film, just like Le Voyage dans la Lune was. Um, it's about essentially. Uh, future society that's heavily industrialized, uh, but you have this stratification between those that are the haves and the have-nots. And there's this figure, this character in the story, Maria, who uh, is you know, trying to help those that are on the lowest rungs of society. And the son of the great industrialist falls in love with her. Um, but there's... Um, essentially like this mad scientist, Rotlong, who's working for the great industrialist who wants to sabotage uh, the work of Maria to help these people. And so he creates an artificial being that is that takes the form of Maria and wreaks havoc. Um, and ultimately, um, uh, Frieder and, and Maria have to, um, you know, save the world and in this circumstance. And then a final film that I wanted to mention before we uh, get into the 1950s is James Wales 1931 film Frankenstein. Uh, this is obviously based on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein from 1818 um, but the story has some considerable changes to it. Uh, and I highly recommend you watch it. Now that you've read the story, you should know what it's about. Um, but in James Whale's Frankenstein, we see Boris Karloff, a uh, famous actor uh, in these, um, these early you know, monster films. Um, what well, we can call them monster films, even though we can obviously say that they're science fiction, but there's always like this monster creature uh, in them. Boris Karloff is the monster. Uh, Henry Frankenstein, played by Colin Clive, uh, creates him with the help of his assistant Fritz, played by Dwight Fry. And as you know, or hopefully you know from reading Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, there is no Fritz. Uh, there is no assistant that's helping Frankenstein. And also Frankenstein obviously wasn't named Henry. Uh, again, this is American movie making uh, at play here. Uh, but one thing that's interesting about the 1931 film that you might pay attention to is that James Whale was, you know, at that time, um, an openly gay 
uh, film director, uh, which you know, is kind of mind blowing to imagine someone would um, you know, be out in that way at that time in our history. Um, and in this film, there's a considerable amount of homoeroticism um, that um, adds new layers to the story. Um, and it's worth watching and thinking about some of these things. There's a lot of research that's been done on that, uh, which you'd be able to find through um, the databases that I talked about in the research lecture uh, last week, if, you, if you're interested in that. And even though I said that we're, you may not write your research essay on something that we talked about in the class, if you want to write your research essay on an adaptation and take on that adaptation on its own terms, it's fair game. So like you could choose Frankenstein, this 1931 movie, or one of the many other adaptations of Frankenstein over the years, um, and discuss it on its own terms. How you might be able to also uh, discuss like how the film is different than the original text and how that may make it more or less science fictional. You get to decide that. Now, in the next part of the lecture, I want to talk about some uh, films that took place in what we call the science fiction film boom of the 1950s, where we started seeing a lot more science fiction filmmaking uh, during these, um, this mid-century time, right after World War II. And the neat thing about all these, to a, to a less extent, Forbidden Planet, at least with these that I want to discuss, all of them are based on science fiction stories that were originally printed um, in uh, the magazines or as novels. Okay, So first is The Thing from Another World, also called simply The Thing. This is from 1951. And it's based on John W. Campbell Jr.'s story, Who Goes There? from the August 1938 um, story that was actually written under his pen name, Don A. Stewart. And this is a you know, real interesting story of a shape-shifting alien um, that is basically able to infiltrate uh, this Arctic research station um, by you know, aping the creatures, the, the, the beings, human beings, uh, that are there. And in the, in the film, uh, James Arness, the guy who would later play Marshal Matt Dillon on the TV series Gunsmoke, portrayed the alien thing uh, in the story. Uh, and the, as I mentioned before with film, that there's always this element of metaphor uh, that we obviously see in literature as well, but maybe not quite so apparently. But in The Thing from Another World, issues of uh, communist subversion and McCarthyism two important historical topics you ought to know about. So if you don't know what those mean, look them up on Wikipedia. Uh, communist subversion and, and McCarthyism, um, where you have essentially the alien infiltrating uh, the human species and pretending to be a human being for its own purposes. And in this case, like, you know, how a communist is imagined as infiltrating the free world. Also in 1951, we have The Day the Earth Stood Still. And this is an, a story about idealism of the peaceful world through superior might. And in the story, aliens attempt to enforce peace on humanity, uh, which is seen as increasingly dangerous due to the, to the development of nuclear weapons. And this particular story is based on Harry Bates, B-A-T-E-S, Harry Bates' story, Fare, Fell, Farewell to the Master, which was published in the October 1940 issue of Astounding. Another story uh, that also is a parable of communist invasion is the 1953 production of War of the Worlds, and it's based on H.G. Wells' 1898 novel. But again, getting into like issues of adaptation, in the original Wells novel, the Martians, once they land on Earth, they use these powerful and tall tripod walking machines. Imagine like AT-ATs from Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, uh, but having only three legs. Um, in the, this film version, they basically were hovercraft. They look really neat, 
um, but also quite different than like how they're originally depicted in Wells's uh, novel. Um, and also they're equipped with nuclear death rays. But one of the neat things about that the film is like there's a, a lot of red shading uh, taking place when the aliens are around. And again, this gets into issues of communism and, and the color red and the red flag. Um, and War of the Worlds is simply essentially a metaphor uh, for this communist invasion. Then in 1955, we have This Island Earth. And this is a space opera uh, that explores tension between isolationism and embrace of the other. And in the story, uh, uranium is obtained uh, and human scientists are enlisted to help the Metalunans fight the Zagons before their home world is taken. But when it is, the Metalunans attempt to hide on Earth and control the minds of the scientists. Again, this is based on a, a, a literary science fiction work, a 1952 novel um, by Raymond F. Jones. And maybe perhaps more interesting is that novel is an expansion on earlier short stories that Jones had published you know, even earlier. So you can imagine these short stories become a novel, the novel then becomes this film, uh, This Island Earth. But now this brings us to Forbidden Planet uh, from 1956. Um, and these are some points about the film that I want to make sure you know that you look for whenever you are watching other films in the future. It's like you need to pay attention to who is the director, uh, who was the film studio that produced it and distributed it. What are the characters' names? Who are the actors and actresses that portray those characters? These are the kinds of uh, things that you need to know to be able to talk about uh, film intelligently. The same way that whenever you talk about a science fiction story, you need to know about who is the author, where was it published, how was it published, when was it published, who were the characters, what's the settings, etc. So with Forbidden Planet, it was released in 1956, and it was released by MGM Studios. It was directed by Fred McLeod Wilcox, Fred, F-R-E-D, McLeod, M-C-L-E-O-D, Wilcox, W-I-L-C-O-X. And unlike the stories I just talked about, Forbidden Planet is an adaptation in a certain regard of something much older than science fiction. It's a space opera that is an interpretation of Shakespeare's The Tempest. And The Tempest uh, is a play by William Shakespeare, probably written uh, in between 1610 and 1611, and then later published in its folio form in 1623. Now, what I thought I would do is, before I get into what the film is about, is I want to read to you the description of the play from Wikipedia. That way you have a broad overview about what The Tempest is about. And then when you watch Forbidden Planet, you'll be able to make connections between what William Shakespeare wrote in his play and how those characters and ideas get transformed, how they get adapted into this film, Forbidden Planet. So this is all according to Wikipedia, what I'm reading now. And as I've said before, your Wikipedia is not a place you go to cite information, but when you need to learn about something quickly, when you need to look for sources that you follow up on your own research, Wikipedia is a great place to go. So don't quote from it as far as your research essay is concerned, but go there to get background information to educate yourself about things and then look at its own list of resources, where the information comes from, that's written on the Wikipedia page. It's going to be at the very bottom of the page, but those sources you can then try to follow up through our library in order to have you know, uh, good primary and secondary uh, resources for your research. So this is about The Tempest first. Okay, The Tempest is a play by William Shakespeare, probably written in 1610 to 1611, 
and thought to be one of the last plays that Shakespeare wrote alone. After the first scene, which takes place on a ship at sea during a tempest, the rest of the story is set on a remote island where the sorcerer, Prospero, a complex and contradictory character, lives with his daughter, Miranda, and his two servants, Caliban, a savage monster figure, and Ariel, an airy spirit. The play contains music and songs that evoke the spirit of enchantment on the island. It explores many themes, including magic, betrayal, revenge, and family. So some of these characters I just mentioned, Prospero, Miranda, Caliban, and Ariel, I'll mention in a minute like how they appear in the film Forbidden Planet. So going into a little bit more depth of The Tempest. A ship is caught in a powerful storm. There is terror and confusion on board, and the vessel is shipwrecked. But the storm is a magical creation carried out by the spirit Ariel and caused by the magic of Prospero, who was the Duke of Milan before his dukedom was usurped and taken from him by his brother Antonio. That was 12 years ago when he and his young daughter Miranda were set adrift on the sea and eventually stranded on the island. Among those on board the shipwreck are Antonio and Alonzo. Also on the ship are Alonzo's brother, Sebastian, son Ferdinand, and trusted counselor, Gonzalo. Prospero plots to reverse what was done to him 12 years ago and regain his office. Using magic, he separates the shipwreck survivors into groups on the island. Ferdinand, who is found by Prospero and Miranda, is part of Prospero's plan to encourage a romantic relationship between Ferdinand and Miranda, and they do fall in love. Trinculo, the king's jester, and Stefano, the king's dr drunken butler, who are found by Caliban, a monstrous figure who had been living on the island before Prospero arrived, and who Prospero adopted, raised, and enslaved. These three will raise an unsuccessful coup against Prospero, acting as the play's comic relief by doing so. Alonzo, Sebastian, Antonio, Gonzalo, and two attendant lords, Adrian and Francisco, Antonio and Sebastian conspire to kill Alonzo and Gonzalo so Sebastian can become king. At Prospero's command, Ariel thwarts this conspiracy. Later in the play, Ariel, in the guise of a harpy, confronts the three nobles, Antonio, Alonzo, and Sebastian, causing them to flee in guilt for their crimes against Prospero and against each other. The ship's captain and boatswain, along with the other sailors, are asleep until the final act. Prospero betroths Miranda to marry Ferdinand and instructs Ariel to bring some other spirits and produce a mask. The mask will feature classical goddesses Juno, Ceres, and Iris and will bless and celebrate, celebrate the betrothal. The mask will also instruct the young couple on marriage and on the value of chastity until then. The mask is suddenly interrupted when Prospero realizes he had forgotten the plot against his life. He orders Ariel to deal with this. Caliban, Trinculo, and Stefano are chased off into the swamps by goblins in the shape of hounds. Prospero vows that once he achieves his goals, he will set Ariel free and abandon his magic, saying, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. Ariel brings on Alonzo, Antonio, and Sebastian. Prospero forgives all three and raises the threat to Antonio and Sebastian that he could blackmail them, though he won't. Prospero's former title, Duke of Milan, is restored. Ariel fetches the sailors from the ship, then Caliban, Trinculo, and Stefano. 
Caliban seemingly filled with regret promises to be good. Stefano and Trinculo are ridiculed and sent away in shame by Prospero. Before the reunited group, all the noble characters, plus Miranda and Prospero, leaves the island. Ariel is told to provide good weather to guide the kingship back to the royal fleet and then to Naples, where Ferdinand and Miranda will be married. After this, Ariel is set free. In the epilogue, Prospero requests that the audience set him free with their applause. So, I mean, this is a very brief snapshot of what The Tempest is about, but with some of those ideas in mind, those characters and what they do and what they represent, I think it will help you unlock some of the things that we see take place in Forbidden Planet. So, this is a little bit about Forbidden Planet, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of its themes and uh, the cast. So the film opens with a spaceship landing to investigate the fate of a colony whose sole survivors are Morbius and Altera. The crew is menaced by an invisible force who we might call Caliban, Morbius's monster from the id, but made possible with Krell technology that he's discovered on this planet. But through the operations of the story, this invisible monster that comes from Morbius's own mind, amplified by the Krell technology, destroys its unwitting creator. And essentially, there is this disaster on the planet, <laughs> but Altera is saved, and off she goes uh, with the crew of the spacecraft. Now, some ideas that you should know about for the story, especially with this Caliban-like invisible force that's on the planet, um, is some of the ideas that come to us from Sigmund Freud. So if you've taken a psychology class, you may already be familiar with some of these. But in a nutshell, there are three parts to our mind. And what you might think of it as, we have a tripartite mind, meaning it has three parts. On the one hand, you have the superego. The superego are all of the laws and rules that we learn as we grow up. On the other end, opposite the superego, you have the id, ID. The id is the bodily desires and impulses that we feel, like you know the visceral emotions, the desire for food, uh, for uh, a mate, all these kinds of things come to us from the id. Now, the superego and the id are, in a sense, bound against one another. And there's this tension. If you can imagine an invisible string here, and that's very tight and tense. That string that balances together the superego and the id is what we call the ego, E-G-O. The ego is the sense of self that forms from the tension between the superego and the id. Uh, and if we want to go even further back, you can look to Plato's tripartite division of the soul into reason, spirit, and appetite. So you can look up Plato's tripartite division of the soul to get an even earlier version of this before Freud. Now, one other thing about Forbidden Planet is like unlike those other films I said before were based on stories that had already been published um, as science fiction, Forbidden Planet is based on something that's not science fictional. Um, it is more, you know, fantasy. Um, William Shakespeare's The Tempest, but it is taking the fantastic and applying maybe some science to what those things might be through like aliens and high technology. But there was a novelization that came out before the film was released. Uh, that goes into further depth about the Krell, the aliens that provide the technology uh, for Morbius. 
Now, looking at the characters in the film, just like the major characters, we have Morbius, who's played by Walter Pidgeon, and Morbius is the Prospero character, if we want to think about William Shakespeare's The Tempest. He's an obsessive scientist living alone with his daughter on this alien world, like an island out in the vast cosmos of space. Then you have his daughter, Altera, A-L-T-A-I-R-A, -A, who's played by Anne Francis. And she's the virginal Miranda figure on the planet Altair IV. Okay? Now, arriving on the planet via the spaceship, we have Commander J.J. Adams, played by Leslie Nielsen. And you may know Leslie Nielsen later as like a comedic actor, but here he's playing a very straight role um, as the commander of the spacecraft. And he's our Ferdinand character. He's the guy that is going to fall in love with Altera, and he's going to take her away once they are able to uh, extricate themselves uh, from what's going on with Morbius. But now, around Orbius on Altair is another, another character, and that's Robbie the Robot. And Robbie the Robot is the aerial figure, the, the sprightly, airy figure who's able to, to do things, in a sense, with magic, but in this case, with like high technology. And I'll just say of this, you know, without going into a lot of depth, is that culture works on us and through us. Stories from the past become a part of our shared heritage. Writers and art artists often draw on these shared parts of our heritage to create new art. Sometimes it is deliberate and sometimes it is unconscious. This is one of the reasons why the artificial constraints of copyright that we have today a recent development largely brought about through the lobbying power of the Walt Disney Company and other media conglomerates, want to own our culture in perpetuity, meaning forever. With the speed of culture and technologies change in the 21st century, I see this as one of the next great cultural battles to find a resolution that respects intellectual property rights for a reasonable time and respects the rights of people to carry on the development of our culture with the art that becomes a part of our shared culture. I mean, we've been able to access a lot of different stories because of you know, certain allowances and copyright law and those that wish to preserve our shared digital heritage on archive.org. Um, and with Forbidden Planet, they were able to create the story based on William Shakespeare's The Tempest because The Tempest is part of the public domain. They, you know, Shakespeare isn't around anymore, and so many centuries have passed since he wrote it that it's now something that we all can take advantage of. We can all write our own adaptations of The Tempest if we want to. But with newer culture, um, because of changes to copyright law, even things that were created like, you know, decades, even a century ago, could still be under copyright. And so I, I just raise this as a question for you guys to be thinking about, is like how, uh, you know, what, what, in what ways is copyright like a good thing, you know, protecting the rights of those that are creators and, and makers of our culture, while at the same, same time it can be an impediment, something that holds people back whenever our shared culture, like especially if you think about memes today, um, are such an important way in which we communicate with one another. Uh, something to think about. So, after the lecture, what I'd like you to do is watch Forbidden Planet. Make sure you're making notes both on our my lecture and on your viewing of Forbidden Planet. Look up websites relating to Forbidden Planet. Read what it has to say on wikipedia.org uh, and other places you can find through the library to learn a little bit more on your own. And it may give you some more ideas for your research project. I've been fielding a lot of emails from folks that have ideas for their projects. If you haven't done that yet, make sure you do reach out to me by email with your idea so that I can give you some feedback on that. I might be able to give you some tips that will help you find good stuff uh, to help you with uh, your research and in your writing. Um, if anybody's got questions, make sure you reach out to me by email or stop by my office hours on Wednesday 5 to 6 in Google Hangout. I'll post a link to our Open Lab site 
uh, on Wednesday afternoon for that. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, everybody be safe. You know, take care of yourselves and your loved ones. Um, practice social distancing, wear a mask, you know, keep your hands clean, don't touch your face. Um, do everything you can just you know, not to get sick. But if you get sick, uh, if, it, you know, if you're not able to get over it and it, it holds you back in some way, email me or have someone email me on your behalf just so like I know what's going on. Because I'm thinking about all you guys and I worry about you and I hope that you're all well. Okay, so take care and uh, I'll talk to you all soon.